rocketry and flight are kind of the peanut butter and jelly, the great sandwich we call space exploration. History is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. The future of private space travel. Here are the facts. This is so strange. A lot of people may not be aware of this, but private space travel is not a brand new idea. Well, sure. I mean, think about like, you know, commercial airlines. I mean, those companies were making stuff for the government long before they expanded into the idea of tourism, of like air travel tourism, because it wasn't something that was uh, available or even viable in terms of what people could afford. Uh, it's always how it goes, right? I mean, the companies that make, you know, super, super high tech um, stuff for the government in terms of like data, um, that stuff reaches the public much, much later. But they've been doing stuff for the government all along. No exception with the space program. No. Yeah. The private sector has always played some kind of role in developing new technologies for a government. You think we'll get into all of it, but think about the amount of government grants that go to private companies to create something new that then can be, you know, brought into the government's program to do a thing. Uh, especially, it is especially true with flight, as you said, Noel, and rocketry. Rocketry, big time. Oh, There's a dude. Yeah. Yeah. There's a dude named Goddard. You may know that name from a, a certain NASA space station, uh, Robert Goddard, who is officially the, the father of rocketry. And that dude, it's not like he was given a ton of money to throw into his inventing and uh, his testing. He A lot of that money came out of his own pocket. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> rocketry and flight are kind of the peanut butter and jelly, the great sandwich we call space exploration. And I love, like, I can understand where Goddard is coming from and even investors who might have initially been skeptical about his his concept. Because if you had never heard of a rocket and some guy described it to you while asking you for money, could you be blamed for saying, that's kind of crazy, man. Horses are where it's at, you know? Uh, like, because you're saying, I'm going to put stuff in a tube, okay? And it's going to explode and it'll <laughs> go somewhere. That's my idea. And they're like, okay, Robbie, oh, yeah. uh, where? Well, uh, you know, uh, up, hopefully, kind of up. And then we'll up and you know, to the side, <laughs> up to the side. I mean, you know, it's, I'm sure a lot of people reacted to the idea of, of, of flying in an airplane in the same way. I mean, any new technology that's a big swing is going to be so remarkable and outside of the norm that people are going to kind of balk at it initially. I mean, not everyone can be as forward thinking as like genius inventors. True, true. Uh, even inventors who were killed by their own inventions. Shout out to a awesome. fantastic sure. Wikipedia article. <laughs> Okay, I promise. There are a stop. lot I'm, of them. <laughs> There's so many. It turns out the guy that invented the wood chipper took a tumble right into his own wood chipper prototype. Mm -hmm. Woody got Chippleton. Steve Buscemi all over the snow. Yeah. Woody Chippleton. Long may his memory <laughs> R.I.P. a blessing. Uh, yeah, so I'm glad that you mentioned airplane technology because as World War I hits, we know that war drives technological innovation. Uh, and. Yeah. As World War I hit, it brought along this amazing boom in airplane technology. It took airplane tech to unprecedented heights. Get it? The U.S. government was, I know, sorry, was hand in hand with private entities the whole time. And they wanted these uh, entities to uh, pioneer new industries, maybe without some of the political constraints that governments face, which is going to be a big part of today's show. The Big notable thing here was something called the Air Mail Act of 1925. And this allowed private companies to start flying mail across the country. And then they were flying human passengers, not too much later, first across the country, then across the world. This is important because it establishes a strong precedent. And if we look at the evolution of commercial airlines, we see a pretty robust possibility that this pattern could repeat in the world of spaceflight. I mean, NASA sure is on board. They have been super down to clown with private entities since their early days because they'll say, hey, you already make widgets. Can you help us make a, a kind of 
space widget. You know, it's a, it's an oversimplification, but it's very true. Well, it's also sort of the differentiation between using space for war via satellites that obviously are really important and powerful when it comes to tracking, you know, um, enemy forces or mapping or whatever it might be, or guiding missiles and things like that to the idea of space exploration, which is maybe a little less sexy uh, in the in the war machine kind of uh, kind of model. Right. Or yeah, space yeah. Uh, looking out a window. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. That's it. Some kind of what the what. You know, 11 but, minutes. I mean, he, yeah. And it's not even really space. Whatever. Okay. So, yes. Uh, the One of the big innovations we see is uh, there are a lot of private companies who are trying to do stuff with mixed results. The first object in space that is built entirely by a company, not a government, is the Telstar 1. It's a communication satellite and it is launched in 1962, but it, like all the satellites in the US, are still being launched by NASA, not private companies. The first private company to launch its own thing into space happens in 1982. A company called, in a burst of creativity, Space Services Incorporated, launches the Conestoga One from an island off the coast of Texas. They get to about uh, 192 miles in altitude. But even before that, you had things like the German company Utrog, uh, which <laughs> sounds so epic. Uh, Utrog was trying to develop its own space propulsion systems back in the 70s. Ultimately, they mothballed it in the 80s. And then for decades and decades uh, leading up to the 80s, the U.S. government said only NASA can launch satellites into space. No matter who builds them, you got to work with our team to get them up into the ink. And this changed. In 1984, Congress passed a law as part of a bigger package of deregulation uh, to let private companies do their own launches whenever they wish, as long as they meet, you know, a cavalcade of constraints and paperwork. But this was so important because this set the stage for what we're encountering decades later, a brand new space race. And it's pay to play, baby. Pay so much. Play for 11 minutes max. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really interesting because, you know, when we were growing up, when we were younger guys, little kids in elementary school and high school, uh, there was a space race occurring then in the 1990s and even in the early 2000s. Uh, it's just, I don't know, for some reason, it, it, nothing really impacted me personally. Uh, I don't I don't remember any of that stuff. I can you can look it up now, the things that were occurring in the 1990s, but nothing was successful. There is, you know, there's a reason why there's no uh, space tourism company that's kind of the grandfather that we're thinking about when these new companies are popping up in the 2010s. Yeah, there's a reason Disney isn't offering space flights right now. You know what I mean? Because if it were more feasible from a technological and financial perspective, then of course people would get into that. Who doesn't want to be the first to be able to do that, right? Uh, as we record, there are people who qualify as space tourists, but very, very few. And spoiler, the majority of those folks are very well off. 